Thanks, Tim. Please be seated. <clears throat> Good to see everybody back this evening. Uh, what a great day it has been. The weather kind of broke, and unfortunately, I was inside all afternoon, but I did see some posts and a lot of people out. It was uh, a nice, warm day. Look forward to hopefully get to be out some tomorrow. It's supposed to be in the 70s, so that will be, uh, be very nice. I want to continue with uh, a series of lessons that I, I started uh, three or four weeks ago now through the Gospel of Matthew. We'll be taking a look at Matthew chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 11 here in, uh, in just a moment. This lesson kind of has ended up being almost part two to Logan's lesson this morning. Uh, we were in two different states as we were putting these lessons together, but it was almost as if we had a conversation uh, uh, about them because they are going to be connected a little bit. Before we begin this, uh, this text tonight, I, I want to, by way of illustration, uh, share a, a personal example from, from our life with you, and then we're going to take a look uh, at the text from Matthew chapter 4. April and I, as, as most of you know, were missionaries in the country of Slovakia. And of course, one of the things that I wanted to do when we moved to Slovakia, I, I wanted to learn the Slovak language. And one of the reasons I wanted to learn the Slovak language was because I believe, and I still do, I believe that the gospel is best presented in someone's heart language. And so we could go and teach the, the, the gospel to the Slovak nation in English, and we did a lot of that. But we believe that once we were able to sit down with a Slovak and teach them in their language, then they would be able to learn and understand the gospel in their heart language, in the, in the language that they grew up in. So uh, I, was, I was a very serious Slovak student. Now, I was a horrible Slovak student <laughs> of, the, of our mission team. Um, I, I, I was horrible. Now, I maybe had the largest vocabulary because I studied Slovak every day. I had a list of vocabulary words in my pocket, and when I was on the tram, I was running through those vocabulary words. After we'd been there a few months, uh, my vocabulary was up. I counted them one day. I was up to about 800 words after we'd been there for about a, um, eight or nine months, and I was asked to say a prayer at a baptism uh, in Slovak. Well, my prayer in Slovak was five words, and four out of five words were incorrect so, uh, you know, that just lets you know the Slovak language is extremely, extremely difficult. And my, my thought was I needed to get out and talk with people uh, daily. And so I had what I considered my tram ministry. And so every day I would go down, I'd either hop on a tram or on a bus, and I would just ride around town. And I was looking for people that I could have conversations with. So I'd, I'd start up a conversation with somebody about something about a child or I, I don't know, whatever it was that I could come up with. And almost every day, this Slovak that I was talking with, one of two things would happen. Either they would recognize that I was not a Slovak and I, was, uh, I knew English, and then all of a sudden that conversation would change from Slovak to English. Or that person would kind of look at me and, and turn their head sideways a little bit. They were understanding my words, but they were going, oh, that is so bad. Um, and sometimes they would laugh at me. Sometimes they would just kind of, you know, roll their eyes. And uh, even, even when I began to preach in Slovak uh, for our congregation, I'd be up and I would make some kind of comment. And it, it feels horrible when you're not telling a joke and half the congregation is shaking because they're laughing because of something that came out of your mouth. That's a true story. That has happened to me more than one time. <laughs> Slovak, I found to be extremely difficult on my self-esteem. <laughs> just being honest with you. I felt ridiculed. I felt laughed at. The number of times that I would come home from one, one of my little tram outings and I was discouraged and depressed. April would, would encourage me and, and uh, you know, sometimes I'd be ready to go home, you know, back, come back to the States and, and April was, was very supportive and she would, she would boost me up and you know what, the next day I'd go back out, I was back on that tram. I just could not get enough abuse for five years, almost every day. Almost every day, we as Americans receive that kind of abuse from, from language. And, you know, 
it, the reason it was such a big deal to me was because I wanted to share the gospel in their language. <laughs> and as I look back at that time, and I, I, I share that with you, not so you feel sorry for me, and please don't make fun of me because I'm, I'm horrible in Slovak, but I share that with you because that time for me was a, a season of testing for me. It was a season of testing. And I learned a lot of things. I learned a lot of things about myself. I learned a lot of things about my wife. My wife was so supportive. I'd go and I'd be so discouraged and I'd almost be in tears. She'd talk me through it. I'd go back out the next day. I learned some things also uh, about the people of Slovakia. And really it's a, it's a common trait among people that it, when somebody says something that's, that's funny, and maybe they're not, again, maybe not meaning it as a joke, we sometimes laugh. Sometimes we do that if we see somebody with, with, a, with maybe a, an expression, or, and, and we talked about this not too long ago, but sometimes even somebody that has maybe a strange birth defect, we see them and then instantly we just almost laugh or we, we, we feel kind of like we want to laugh inside. You'll know what I'm talking about. It's kind of a shame to say that, but it's just who we are. But the Slovak people, I don't think, were being mean to me. They weren't trying to belittle me. They weren't trying to ridicule me. They weren't trying to embarrass me. They just thought it was humorous what came out of my mouth, and so they would laugh. And so I, th that's just one thing about people. Sometimes we maybe laugh, or we roll our eyes, or we make a funny expression on our face, when somebody says or does something and, and maybe we hurt their feelings, it's not, we're not intending to do that. It's just, we're just people. It's just what we do. But I learned that about the Slovak people and really about us in general, that we, we are not mean, spirited. We, we just respond to things sometimes. A third thing that I learned, I, I really learned perseverance from this. Uh, and I learned humility as well, but I learned perseverance. It was, it was, Slovak language was every day. It, I, I, in, in my mind, if I did not spend a day on Slovak, it was a, one day I lost. So even when we were back in the States on furlough, I was working on Slovak language. I was memorizing things, working on my, on my, uh, on my grammar and those kinds of things. But with all of the mistakes and ridicule and disappointment and embarrassment, I needed that time. I needed that period, that season of testing, I believe, to make me who I am today. I, I, I serve as, as an elder, and, and elders know, and ministers know, that life isn't always rosy. Sometimes we have people that come in and, and visit with us about things that are just hard, difficult things to talk about. I believe that this, my, my experience in Slovakia, I believe God helped grow me up in some ways and understand that there is a, a season of testing that we all go through. So with that in mind, I want for us to go to our text now, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. I want to read this whole text, and then we're going to talk about a few things here. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. The tempter came and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, On the other hand it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. So this is a passage that we're all familiar with. We've heard many lessons about the temptations 
of Jesus. And most of the time, we center in on the, the, the three specific examples of temptation that we, did, that we just read about. But I want for us to notice a couple verses here. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 13, Mark records this for us. And now, Mark doesn't have much about the temptations. This is basically it. What he says is, he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. Now, what, what does that bring to mind? <laughs> does that sound like Jesus was just tempted three times? No. Matter of fact, I believe that this 40-day wandering in the wilderness, in the desert, was a 40-day season of testing and temptation for Jesus. I believe it started when the Spirit led him out. We'll talk about some, some additional ideas here in just a moment. This was an entire season. This wasn't just three. Over in Luke chapter 4, in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 in Luke's account, here's what he says. He says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Again, it seems to indicate a 40-day period. He was tempted throughout. Now, we just have the big three, and of course those come at the very end, I believe, of that 40 days, and that's really probably kind of the climax of all that. And of course, Jesus, at the end of that 40 days, after the third temptation, he says, Satan, you get out of here. If you look down at Luke chapter 4, verse 13, the devil had finished this temptation, every temptation, it says, he left him until another opportune time. So Satan will definitely come back. Satan, we can read through the gospel accounts and find time after time after time when there's no doubt in my mind that Satan was there. Well, you just, just read through the, especially in the Gospel of John, look at those accounts. And <laughs> Satan was right there trying to get to our Lord, trying to trip him up. Well, let's go back now and let's think about these temptations that's recorded for us in, in, in these three Gospels. And let's talk about them a little bit. The first temptation was turning rock stones into bread. But what I want for you to notice is how Satan begins the temptation. The question is, if you are the Son of God. He does it on the first temptation. If you'll notice, he does it on the second temptation. Takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple. If you are the Son of God. And really the third one is implied that that is there because the third one, he takes him up I think he probably took him up to Mount Nebo is where, if I was Satan, that's where I would have took you, that same place he, that Moses was, when he got to see all of the promised land. So he stands up there and he gets to look over, and what, however Satan does this, I have no idea, but Satan apparently has the ability to kind of bring all of these images before Jesus. And he shows all those to Jesus, and he basically he's saying, didn't you come to win all these people anyway? I'll give them to you. You don't even have to fight for them, Jesus. I'll give them to All you got to do is bow down and worship me, and we're done here. Basically, if you're the Son of God, and you want all these kingdoms, take them. All three of these hinged on this idea of if you are the Son of God. Now, why is Satan telling Jesus that? Well, let's scoot back 40 days. Scoot back 40 days. What just happened? What did we look at last week? The baptism of Jesus. And when Jesus came up out of the water, what did what God say from heaven? This is who? My beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately then, what happens? This Son that has just been proclaimed to the world by God is now led into the wilderness with Satan nipping at his heels like a little chihuahua that whole time. <laughs> For 40 days and 40 nights, he's not eating. He's got Satan nipping at his heels the whole way through. Satan finally says, you're the son of God? Had Jesus worked a miracle yet? No. Had Jesus really even taught anything yet? No. He just looks like a man. And here, God proclaims, you are, the, you are my son, immediately goes into the desert, 
Nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. Satan is capitalizing on this idea, if you are the Son of God, then let's see something here. Do a show for me. Turn, turn these rocks into bread. Throw yourself off. Now, here's the neat thing here. This, one, this is one of, those, one of those deals that brings tears to my eyes. Did you know that this phrase, if you are the Son of God, it is used two different times in Scripture, in two different contexts. You know where the other place is? Anybody remember? Matthew 27, 20. Jesus hanging on the cross. If you're the Son of God, come down. What did God just do for Jesus in the wilderness with those temptations and that 40-day fast? What did He do? He got Him ready for the most important event in human history. You think, Jesus, you think Satan's right there? Yeah, Jesus, come on off. Absolutely. Where do you think this guy came up with this phrase? This was Satan's idea at the beginning. This is, this is straight from the mouth of Satan again. He told this guy, however that went down, I don't know. But there's Jesus on the cross. If you're the Son of God, come down from that cross. And so what's going on in the mind of Jesus now? You know what? I remember. I remember this. I remember this the time that I was the most tired I have ever been in my life. I was hungrier than I've ever been in my life. I was hot. I, excuse me. I was hot. I was tired. I was worn out. Satan said the same thing to me. Jesus went through a season of testing in the wilderness with Satan nipping at his heels to prepare him for something great. Now let's bring this home a little bit. What did Jesus learn here? What did he learn from this time that he spent in the wilderness that allowed him to be victorious at the cross? Well, first of all, he learned obedience. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8, the Hebrew writer just puts it out there pretty clear. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Make no mistake, he suffered during that 40-day fast in the wilderness. That was, would have been miserable for 40 days. You know, the other thing I thought of, isn't it interesting that it took this event of a 40-day fast in the wilderness, in the heat, being dirty and tired and, and hungry. That's what it took to, got, to get Jesus ready for the trip to the cross. Now, that, that's, that's amazing to me. Now, the trip to the cross was the most difficult thing He will ever do. Don't misunderstand. But this was His season of preparing for that. And I believe that as Jesus was traveling to the cross, he could remember this event. And I believe he took courage from this. He learned obedience. He learned that, hey, the Father has got a plan for me. And I believe when Jesus got done with this 40-day season of, of, of these temptations, can you imagine how victorious Jesus felt at that point? And I think he could think back from the cross, go, I, I was victorious over this. I, I listened to my Father. I was obedient as the Father led me around in the wilderness. And I came out on the other side victorious. Obedience is no doubt something Jesus learned from this event. I wanted to say one other thing about obedience before we go to reliance. You know, learning obedience, let me use this as an, as an example. Southern is a, is a pretty good boy. I, I really I believe this. He's a good boy. He does a lot of things right. He talks nice. He behaves nice. Riley, I think, kind of likes him. She would say, yeah, he's nice to me. But you know, that isn't, it, that isn't obedience. That's because he's a good boy. But when Southern, or when Southern, when Summer <laughs> or Logan tell him, do this, and it's something he doesn't want to do and he does it anyway, that's obedience. You see what I'm saying? Jesus was a good boy. Jesus did a lot of good things. 
but he demonstrated his obedience as he wanders into the desert here. He's being led by the Spirit, the Scripture says. Not dragged. The Spirit didn't grab him by the nose and drag him. He, he goes under his own will because he was being obedient to the Father. And brothers and sisters, I believe that's an important lesson for us. Number two, Jesus learned reliance as well. I, I, I can't imagine a 40-day a fast anywhere, much less a 40-day fast in this kind of thing. <laughs> in the wilderness, in the desert, in the heat. Jesus, there's only one way He made it, and that was through His alliance, His reliance on His Father. There's a phrase in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23. Now this phrase in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 23 is talking about the cross. Okay? It's talking about Him enduring the cross. Starting verse 21, He says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow any steps. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth. Of course, that's right from the, from the crucifixion scene. And while he, being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. But he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Notice the phrase, he kept entrusting himself. I believe that this event caused Jesus to have a deep reliance on his Father. And he entrusted himself to his Father in all things. And when he finally got to the time when he's got to go through the cross, he still has that reliance. He has the obedience down. He learned, I believe he learned that during this season of testing. He's got the reliance down. He learned that also here. And then number three, I believe that this also boosted his confidence. I'll tell you, Rick's uh, Devo, if you missed it Wednesday night, it was outstanding. It was short and sweet and to the point. And he talked about how important it is for us to have confidence. We take a look at the life of Jesus and it is absolutely filled with confidence. We talked about Matthew chapter 16 verse 21. We talked about this actually the last couple, in the last couple lessons out of Matthew. But in Matthew 16, 21, after they're done up there at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus is headed back to Jerusalem and he tells the guys, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be beat, I'm going to be scourged, I'm going to be killed, and then I'm going to be raised from the dead. And starting in 1621, you will find that every little while, there's five or six of those in the next few chapters. Jesus telling his disciples, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to crucifixion. And then remember we looked in the Gospel of Luke, and as they're heading to Jerusalem, who's leading the pack? Jesus is. Jesus is the one out front. Why is He doing that? Because He is confident. He knows what's happening here. He knows that God is in control and He knows that He can rely on Him. Well, let's think for just a minute about some lessons that we can learn from this as well. Well, first of all, I would suggest that we can learn to consider it all joy. I think we've all been through seasons of testing at different times in our lives. And looking back now at things like looking back at my Slovak language uh, <laughs> failure, whatever that was, I can consider that all pure joy. Because what James says is that as we think about our suffering, and we think about the things that we've gone through, James said, consider it all joys, my brothers, when you face various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you will be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In Romans chapter 5, Paul writes a, just a great, a great little series here. Romans chapter 5, starting verse 3. He says, and not only this, but we exalt in our tribulation knowing that tribulation brings perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. We need to consider it all joy as we go through our seasons of testing. 
Secondly, not only do we need to consider our seasons of testing joy, but we need to expect more of them. In Hebrews chapter 12, the Hebrew writer makes it pretty clear that there will be seasons of testing that will come. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 4, the Hebrew writer says this. He says, You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My sons do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by Him. For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? There is more season of testing in my life. No doubt. Matter of fact, right now I may be going through, and you may be going through a particular season of testing right now. Well, that's okay. God is teaching us and training us for whatever lies in our future. I, I don't know what God is doing with the Church of Christ in Durant, Oklahoma. But I believe He is teaching and He is training and He is testing and He is getting us ready for whatever lies ahead of us. I say, Father, bring it on. Help us be faithful because we've got a big task ahead of us. And that's okay. That's okay. But we will learn through these seasons of testing and number three, I think the third thing that we can learn is we can just learn about hope. I, I was visiting with somebody this morning. I, I don't remember now who it was, but uh, she will recognize this story. But she came up to me and she said, how do people, and we, were, we were talking about Logan's lesson, they said, how do people survive who are not Christians? <laughs> when people go through these seasons of testing, and, and they have nothing to, no place to hang their hat, no place to put their hope, no place to put their confidence. How do they make it through? I don't know. I don't know how people make it through. But for us as Christians, we find great hope in the seasons of testing. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, Logan read this one this morning as well. But Paul says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And so we think back about all of the events from the Old Testament that we've read, all the, even the, the, the accounts that we just looked at, the New Testament examples as well. But we think of men like Joseph. And think about the things, think about the period of testing that he went through. We think about Ruth and the, the, the trials that they went through. We think about Esther. We think about King David. We think about Job. Over and over and over, we see these examples of men and women of faith who are going through seasons of testing, and they come out the other side with a great hope for the future. And brothers and sisters, that needs to be us. That needs to be us with a great hope for the future. Well, it may be this evening that you are experiencing or traveling through a season of testing. I just want to encourage you to keep on, just hold on, keep on, keeping on. But if you need some help as you travel through this, let the congregation here help. Let's get together and pray. Let's get together and talk about it. Let's study some about it. If there's a, a, any help that we can offer, we want to make that available for you tonight. It may be that there's someone here tonight who has not been baptized into Christ and begun the journey of their Lord. If we can help you in any way, would you please come while we stand and sing?